people so that what we're doing will be very accessible to you, I hope, and um, not very difficult to grasp a hold of. So we're trying to move a little slower than we I have in the past, and I hope that will help you. So you can see here what we're going to do. Um, so first I want to tell you how to work with Excel spreadsheets. So my experience with MATLAB is that people often have data, especially if you, if you do la when you go do your laboratory classes, you might go to the lab and collect data, and everyone likes to put data in Excel spreadsheets, right? And so um, I'm going to teach you how to import data from an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can do all the manipulations in MATLAB. Um, I'll talk briefly about things like folders and workspace, which we've talked about, but maybe a little more detail. And then I'm going to go through an example just showing you how to manipulate various manipulations you can do on data. Um, and then I'll give you a little exercise at the end. To do the exercise at the end, you have to download an Excel spreadsheet from the website. It's there. Um, so hopefully you have access to the website right now. And if you go under lecture notes, then you'll see today's lecture, and then you'll see that it has an example file called penicillin.xls. So to do the exercise at the end, you'll have to download that, that file. Okay? All right. So without further ado, so here's my philosophy about Excel, which I already explained to some degree, that Excel's nice for organizing data, um, but it's not nice for analyzing data, at least not as nice as MATLAB to me, okay? So I think in many cases you'll have data in Excel and you would like to import that in, into MATLAB. You can also have things in MATLAB that you export to Excel, which I don't really focus on because I don't know why you'd want to do that because once you get it into MATLAB, you can do everything you want. But you can, so you can read an Excel file. That's this command, which I'll show you how to use. This XLS read thing here that reads a, an Excel spreadsheet and then puts the results, the information in that spreadsheet into the MATLAB workspace where we can work with it. And then you also have a command called XLS write. It's a little um, confusing. Well, it's a little com more complex to use than the read statement. So what this does is allow you to take the things in the MATLAB workspace and write them to an Excel file. Um, when I teach the class, I teach you things that I use and my research group uses. So if, if we don't tend to use something, I tend not to focus on it. So if we don't tend to write to Excel, so I'm, I'm not really going to focus on that. And there's one other command. If, if basically, you issue this command, you can determine if something actually is an Excel spreadsheet if you don't know yourself. Okay? But usually you know whether a file is Excel or not, and you want to work with it. Okay. So here's a little example. Let me actually run this guy in Excel, I mean in MATLAB. Let me, I've been playing around here. I believe in playing around in MATLAB each day some. No date's really complete without it. All right, so again, if we're in MATLAB here, don't worry about the stuff above. Uh, the we have the typical um, layout here. Okay, over here are a bunch of files. This is not where I want to be. I'm going to change the directory. And I have all my stuff in this thing called MATLAB courses. So you can see there's all these files that I've created over the years for use in the different courses. Uh, this is the window where we issue commands at the prompt. This is the workspace, right? I hit the clear command to clear the workspace, so there's nothing there right now. And then this is the history, so this is all the commands I've done in the past. I, te I tend never to use the history, but I use the arrows a lot to move through commands. Okay? All right. So, let's see. Apparently I have an Excel spreadsheet called CSTRXLS. Now, when you're over here, you can click on this in MATLAB, and it will open up um, a preview of what that Excel spreadsheet looks like. So you, can, you don't have to get out of MATLAB to look at it if you want to look. So you can see this is a spreadsheet that has um, three columns, okay? And um, basically five rows with data of some kind, which I'll explain in a minute, okay? So we can import this spreadsheet into uh, MATLAB, and let's see how I chose to do it, X, okay? Usually I've done all these things before, so I'm just going to try to find the command with the arrows because I don't, there it is, okay? So this is how you use the command. Well, so the way MATLAB works is if you issue a command without anything on the left-hand side, it'll just do the following. It'll define a variable called answer, <laughs> okay? Which is what this has been read into. So what I've done here is issued a command, said read this 
Excel spreadsheet, you have to put the name of the spreadsheet in quotes and has the extension obviously .xls and this is, this is the information it gives you, okay? If you don't specify what you want, it's going to call it answer, but I usually don't like working with something called answer, so I'll call that thing x, okay? So you can, you can look and see up in here in the, in the workspace, you can see now you have something called x, it has five rows and three columns, okay? If you want to, you can look at x like that, okay? And you can see exactly what's in there. This doesn't work so well if the, if the matrix is really large. Like if the matrix is 50 by 50 and you type x, you'll just get 250 numbers printed out. It'll be hard to make sense of it. But something small, it's pretty easy to do that with. Okay. Um, so what I've done in these, I don't know if I'll do exactly the same thing, but I'm just telling you what I do. Anytime I get a matrix like this, you could, you could look at it up there, but I often use this command because I want to see what the dimensions of the matrix are. If you want to, for example, this command here, if I typed it in right, I didn't. Not even close. Okay. So what this command does is says, please tell me the elements of this matrix. The first row, that's it. so when you index these are called indexes of the matrix. The first one means what row, and the second one means which column. So when you issue this command, you're saying, please print out to the, you know, um, to the display all elements in the first row. First row, all elements. That colon here means all elements, okay? So that just prints out the first row, as you can see, of the matrix. If instead of the first row, you want the first um, column, then you can issue this command then that prints out the first column. This is useful because sometimes you want to look at a particular row or column, not the whole matrix, okay? You can also look at a particular element if you want, okay? So if, if you look back at X, you'll see that's the two, two element. So that means second row, second column, okay? So you have to, using MATLAB now, and when we get into matrix algebra, you'll have to get familiar with this notation. It's common through both, so again, First elements, which row? Second elements, which column? Okay? So I'm not even telling you what that data is for. We're actually going to use it later in the semester. But for now, I just wanted to show you how to load it in, how to check its dimension, how to look at a row, how to look at a column, a particular element, what have you. Okay? So that's all I did here. Okay. Um, so... The MATLAB, when you create MATLAB files, they're all organized into folders. So if you come back and you look over here, okay, you will see that I actually don't have any folders, which is actually bad. So when you start having this many files, you could, ar you could ar it's just like Windows or I guess Mac, which I don't use, right? If you start having lots of files, it behooves you to put them in different folders to keep track of everything because it gets too, too uh, cumbersome to try to keep track of things if you don't. I haven't chosen to do so here, but if we go to a different um, example like this one, or maybe that, maybe this one. I'm a crappy filer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, there must be some. This is really, you can see I don't use this. Not sure what this says. Boy. There must be one. I just want to show you what one actually looks like. I'm going to keep trying until I find one. And I'm not going to stop. <laughs> this is, well, you know what? I'm going to stop soon. Don't worry. All right, well. Here's what, here's what I should be doing, or could be doing, maybe is more accurate. Okay, so I have all these files. If I wanted to, I could put these in different folders. The main thing is you're, you're always working in a certain directory, which you can see here, okay? And only if you're working in this directory can you access what's there. So if, if I wanted to do that XLS read command, which I did successfully, right, I think, right here, if I'm in the wrong directory and do that, you get an error. 
because it says, I don't see that. I don't know what you're talking about. So when you get errors like this, and it says, I don't know what you're talking about, but you know it's there, it means you're in the wrong place. It happens. It's the most common error I see students have. So make sure you're in the right working directory. If you were to need to um, access files in more than one directory at a time, you can use this command, which I don't even think is in the notes, actually. Hopefully I typed this right. Add to path. I am not on a roll. Okay. Let me find out what it actually looks like. Sorry. I have to open it. Don't try to understand what I'm doing right now. I just need an example so I can see the right command. Add path. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. So what this add path command does is if you have files, let's say you have files that you've written that are in two different directories and you want to work with them both, your choice is either take all the files you need and put them in one directory or you can add this command add path and you can put all the different files or directories you wanted to be able to use at the same time so you, don't, so you can not have to move all the files around. All right. Uh, okay, back to this. So, even though some of these commands in principle aren't needed, um, for example, if you want to see what's in the workspace, because you don't want to look up there, sometimes it's too big or you just don't want to look, you can issue this command. If you want more detail on what's there, you can issue that command. So this tells you, the main thing it tells you in addition to the name is the, the size of the matrix. That information is all available here as well. So, um, sometimes you can do this, or you can also issue, so that was a command called dir, meaning directory. Whoops. <laughs> How about I hit return instead of delete? What? Oh, it just keeps printing the same thing. See, I'm not very smart. Or you can hit the command ls, that's an old Unix command if you know what Unix is. And that types all the commands, it just types all the commands that are right there, okay? And hopefully, um, you get an appreciation from working at least with Windows that the, the extension on the file matters, right? So you can see there's different kind of files here. Uh, M files are things I'm going to teach you how to use. They're the main kind of file you create in MATLAB. MDL files are things we'll create next, well not next semester, when you're senior in the control class. Then you can see some of these things are Excel spreadsheets, like the thing we're going to work with later today. And um, I even have, you know, things like zip files and things. I assume you've seen these. Yep. That's, they're identical, yeah. No difference between those. So you can use these various commands. Um, so a lot of these are um, a little bit of an art. Of, I mean, what are you going to do for the most part is you're going to come into MATLAB and you're going to move around to different directories here, okay? This list of directories comes because I've been there before and it knows that I might want to go there again. If you want to go to a directory you've never been, you do this. You, I mean, everyone knows how to move around like Windows or... It's the same thing. It's no, it's no different. Okay? So you can pick whatever directory you'd like to work in from there. Okay, and I do have this add path. So if I looked at the commands I use here, okay, the ones I often use are DRI or LS. I use what sometimes to see what's actually, what files are there. Okay, but it's, it's not, this lists just, what lists just the MATLAB files, and these commands list all files like Excel and zip and whatever else. Um, and then I use this add path if I want to work in a different directory at the same time. You can use the other ones, but it's easier just to move around manually. Okay. All right, so you've seen these kind of commands already, which I'll show them to you again. All right, so again, who, what's there, who's, more detail. Now, sometimes you want to delete something, so you can either type clear, like answer. That will clear just the, that one variable out of the workspace. Once you clear it, it's lost forever. You have to recreate it. If you want to drop a nuclear bomb on the workspace, you can hit clear. It clears everything out, okay? So when I'm working in MATLAB and things, weird things are happening I don't understand, I, I hit clear, because some, sometimes it's hard to explain, but it's kind of like um, 
if your, if your phone isn't working and you don't know what to do, you reboot it, okay? So the next step would be I would close MATLAB and reopen it, you know, this kind of thing. And then I would turn my computer off and restart it, <laughs> okay? But generally, if you start having mis things that you don't understand, like it says dimensions are inconsistent or something, and it used to work, like if it's never worked before, you probably made a mistake, but if it used to work and it's not working now, there's something weird that's happened. I can explain later. But the, the easiest thing to do is clear the workspace and start over. Okay? And again, it's, I, I, don't, I can't tell you how often I use the arrows to go through commands. Because I can't even remember the commands, as, you've, as I think I've proven to you. And um, this way you can redo things very quickly. Okay? So like if I want to read an Excel spreadsheet, and I've done it recently, I just scroll through these commands until I figure out. And then I put a new file name in there. Because I can't remember. Can't remember anything, basically. Okay. Um, these are these are very important here. So let's say you're doing a homework assignment. It's like we're going to have three MATLAB assignments, and they're kind of big assignments, and it'll take you a while to do them, and you probably can't do them all at the same time. Okay. So you understand, like you're going to work an hour, stop, work a couple hours, stop. Um, these commands are very important. I tend not to use, so what's this, save file name? This says, please take everything it's, that's in the workspace currently and save them in something called whatever you want to call it, whatever the file name is, .mat. .mat means it's a MATLAB file and it contains all the elements that are in your, currently in your workspace. And then later when you work again, you can load that. So in other words, it creates a file in the directory that once you close MATLAB, you can subsequently load again. So you can start right where you left off. If you're doing all this work and then you close MATLAB, everything's lost. Okay? So it's always a good idea to save and it's, it's obviously easy to do. You can also do elements like this. If you just want to save certain variables, not everything. So this command, for example, you have three variables called X, Y, and Z. This will save just X, Y, and Z in whatever file name you get it. But I usually just save the whole workspace, not, not certain variables. Okay? So again, if this is trivial calculations like we're doing today, you don't care. But let's just say, by the way, I use this command a lot, control C. So you know, you know this command? So like, let's say you're here and you're just like, I'm not getting anywhere. You just want to stop. So you could backspace and clear it, or you could just hit control C and it'll, okay. All right. So. Let's say you, it, you loaded this and you thought, I'm never going to be able to accomplish that again, which you could, obviously. But let's, you could um, save. I guess you've got to put it in parentheses, or maybe not. I bet this works. Okay. And so now you've created something over here. See, temp.mat. And that saves everything. So if you cleared the workspace, in other words, closed it, reopened, then you could load temp, and then it's back. Okay? So this is really important, that otherwise you're going to lose all your work. Because it doesn't, what MATLAB creates, it doesn't save anywhere unless you explicitly save it. So if you accidentally close MATLAB or MATLAB crashes, MATLAB can crash, right? So it behooves you if you're doing something complex to intermittently save, just like anything else, right? It's not really fundamentally different than that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just go through this example here. This should look familiar to you because this is the example you did last time. So this is this population growth equation, which it was a differential equation, but the main thing is it had this solution here, right? So this is a solution that started out at x naught, if I'm not mistaken, and then I think goes to 1. So x naught is some number less than 1, and then it goes to 1. The solutions look like that. You remember this? I, I didn't label this because I'm lazy. But this is time, and this is that number x. It starts off somewhere, and then it goes up. And how fast it goes there depends on the rate, that r. Okay? All right. So what I'm doing here is I'm just picked this example to run through to give you an example of um, how you can manipulate um, data inside it. Um, MATLAB. Okay? Wasn't any um, grand thing about it. So the first part you've already seen. I'll just point this out. You already did this last time, so I'll do it quick. 
right? Here's the equation. What do we want to do? We want to plot x versus time for one value of x naught, but three different values of r, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm just defining x naught. I'm defining the three values of r. I'm defining time, right? So if I define time like this, that's saying I want to create a vector called t, which means time. Start at 0, end at 10, go in increments of 1. So 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 10. Okay? And in this case, I don't put the semicolon. I print it out. That's what it looks like. I'm working with small t. You know, I told you in the past you should use a lot of points so this thing looks smooth, but I wanted to print things out, so I'm using not a very, not a very large number. Okay. Then you might recall this dot here. What I found last time is the only place you actually need the dot is right there. Remember I said the dot makes... If you don't tell MATLAB otherwise, it wants to do matrix cal and scale, uh, sorry, vector and matrix calculations. The, so this says, please do a, a scalar calculation. In other words, divide by element by element. So if you have a vector t here, which you do, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the value r1 and I'm computing the solution for that. I'm calling that x1. I'm going to do the same thing for r2, call it x2, r3, call it x3. So this command says, please create a vector x1 that's the same dimension as t and do it element by element. In other words, x1 corresponds to the, this equation for the first value of time, in other words, 0. Second element's for time equal 1, so on and so forth. If you don't issue that command, you'll get something you don't want. Okay? So if you do all this, you can see for the first case, um, I issued this command. I didn't put the semicolon, so there are the results, right? So it's starting off at the initial condition. That's good. That's where we told it to start. And it's increasing as we expect. It's approaching 1. OK, fine. So let me just do this real quick. I think I have all these commands. Are, I've already done this, but let's see. Let's just Good. Good. Uh, Okay, that's it, right? I need to compute x1. Oops, I didn't create the t vector. See, I'm too lazy to type a single command. I'm just, go I'm just hoping I did all these commands in the past, and the answer is I did usually, but I did other commands too. What? Oh. That's not right, is it? I guess it is. Okay. All right. So let's see. Okay. So now I've created the the three vectors. There's x1, for example, right? So I've specified a vector of times. So I've course I've s computed the corresponding values of x for three different values of r, r1, r2, r3. Okay, so there's nothing new about this. There's <laughs> nothing exciting about this. But what I'm doing on the next slide is showing you how to concatenate these vectors. In other words, if I want to put all the x values instead of in three separate vectors, I want to put it all in one matrix. So that's what I'm doing on this slide. So I'll show you, I'll show you what I mean. So first of all, I'm obsessed with, you'll, you'll be obsessed too, the size of these vectors and matrices. Okay. So I see this. So what does it mean x1 is? Well, you can see what it means because it's printed out. It means x1 is a single row with 11 columns. That's what it's telling you. Okay. There's a command called prime. You'll learn this in linear algebra. It's called transpose. It just means you make a column into a row or a row into a column. So if you issue this thing, it looks like a column instead of a, a row, right? And if you were to issue that command, you'd see now it's, it's the same thing, same information, but now it's in, in, a, in a single column instead of a single row. So, ele sorry, <laughs> yes, 11 rows, one column, okay? Now, there's this command. Well, it's, not a, it's nothing special, so I'm going to put brackets in this thing. So what I want to do is I want to I want to create a matrix with first column being the answer for x1, the second column being the answer for x2, and the third one being a, the answer for x3 in three different columns, okay? So the first, I issue this, oh, let me explain it. Let me do it, and then I'll explain it. Okay? 
So the reason I've put the prime on here is because that way I'll get a vector, right? So this makes x1 a, a single column. This one makes x2 a single column and x3. And so when you put them in the brackets like this, it's going to create a matrix now, okay? And the columns are going to be x1, x2, and x3. If I, okay? And so I'll show you why I'm going to do, why I would want to do this in a minute. If you don't put the primes there, because you don't pay attention to the dimensions of the matrix. Okay, you get the same thing, but it's one row. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. It's X1, and then, so it's, one, it's, a, it's a single row. So the first row, you got 10 elements involving X1, and the next 10 elements are X2 and X3. So it's not, it's not what you want, okay? So back to this. All right, so now let's say that we would like to, because we want to save this data, let's see, let's say. So I assume the next thing I did is concatenate time on there, but let me, let me check. Well, guess not. Okay, so now you have this thing. So now if you issue the command t comma x, it plots all three lines at once. It's just easier working with a matrix of values than trying to maintain three separate vectors. Let's say I wanted to compute the value of x for 20 values of r. I wouldn't really want to have a ma uh, uh, you know, x1, x2, x3, all the way at x20. I'd like to have a big matrix. It's just easier to work with. Okay? Then when you issue this plot command, sorry, what it does is it plots it each column versus time. Okay, so I have three columns, so I see three lines. I didn't label them here, but that's for R2, that's for R1, and this is for R equal 0.5. They're not smooth because I didn't use a lot of points, but I could make them smooth and I could label them and everything else if I wanted to. All right. So, all right. So I gotta, we got to hurry up and get to the, the problem I want you to work on. But let's say we thought, oh, this is great, but we also have time, so let's, let's put time with x. Then you get this command, I mean this error, right? What did I want to call that thing, by the way? Data, okay. So I want to create a new matrix, and I want the first column to be time, and I want the next three columns to be the corresponding values of x, right? And you get this error that says, something's not consistent about the dimensions of the things you're trying to put together. And so if you look at this, you'll see there's something wrong here. Because that T is um, one row and 11 columns, and these things are 11 rows and three columns. The, col the number of columns don't match up, okay? So I can't create a, a, a matrix out of this. So the problem is you, for, you, didn't create, you didn't make T. What you need to do is make T a column, and right now it's a row, right? That's not good. What you need it to be is a column, like that. So what you can do very simply is, oh, sorry. Just put a prime on there so that what was a row becomes a column, and then it looks like that. Okay, so now you have a matrix. It has the values of t, then this is the value of x for, you know, the first value of r, second value of r, third value of r. So it's, and then you, you know, in principle, this could be very valuable. You could save it, but it's all one matrix instead of trying to maintain four, right? We started with four different vectors, t, x1, x2, x3, so this is more convenient to work with. Let's see if I had any illustrative things beyond that. Oh, and now let's say we value this thing so much, okay? that we'd like to save it, you could just say save temp, right? And then you could clear it. And you see all the stuff over there? I hit clear, it's all gonna go away. And then if I load temp, it'll all come back, right? But you could argue at this point, you don't want all that stuff because all the information you ha that you want is, is um, in the, um, let me see. It's all in the th X cr that I created, so maybe I would like to say, okay. I never remember the command, sorry. 
So what this says is pr pl please create a file, a, dot, a mat file, a MATLAB file that's called logistic because it's the logistic equation. Okay? And all I want you to put in there is the, is the data. I don't want all that other stuff because the other, it's just not useful to me. So I can create this thing and then I can clear. Whoops, sorry. I can load. And there it is. Okay? So this is the kind of thing that is not very exciting in a way. It's not very advanced calculations or anything. But if you don't know how to manipulate stuff like this, you, you'll have a lot of trouble using MATLAB. <laughs> okay? So here's the little toy example I want you to do. I think it's pretty easy. Okay? So if you go to the website, there's this spreadsheet called penicillin.xls. Okay? So, and it tells you what, what is included in this file. So someone, us, did two batch penicillin fermentations. So first of all, you know what penicillin is, right? And you know penicillin is produced by microbes. Actually, it was found in a tomato. It's a famous story. Somebody found penicillin, because you know, this was during, I think it was World War II. And so th there was lots of infections. War has a way of propagating infections and causing infections, needless to say. And so they, they you've heard the stories about World War II, how everyone galvanized. They told everyone, try to find, tr gather up weird molds that you might, this is true, gather up weird molds that you might find and send it to us so we can screen it for its ability to make penicillin. Someone found a weird tomato in like Indiana or something with a mold on it. Sent it to the government, that was the, then that's the, that's the organism that currently is used to make penicillin, okay. All right, so we didn't do that, but we did create this, this Excel spreadsheet, okay. So two batch, you know, you guys don't really know what batch means at this point, but if you're going to make penicillin and that's produced by some organism, a microbe, you have to grow it. And that process of growing, it's called fermentation, okay? And don't worry about the batch thing. But what you'll see the data consists of, so we're monitoring how the cells make penicillin as a function of time, okay? So the first column is the time for the experiment in hours, I think it is. The second column is the cell concentration for both experiments stacked on top of each other, which I'll show you in a minute. And the third column is the penicillin stacked on top of each other. So in other words, someone's giving you this. They're giving you T. I think we call this X, and we probably call that P. So time, X means the amount of cells, okay? And this is the amount of penicillin. This will be in like grams per volume, and this will be grams per volume too, okay? And so, they're giving you these in an Excel spreadsheet, and this is a column, and the two experiments are stacked on top of each other. In other words, this is the time for the first experiment, then time starts over for the second experiment. Th same thing for this. And so the goal of this little exercise is just break, basically break this data set down into the two different experiments, right? Because you don't want to really deal with, this is, somebody put it in this form, but this is not really the form you want, okay? So the idea is you want to manipulate. So first of all, you have to go get to the spreadsheet. You have to get it from the website. Once you get the spreadsheet, you have to load it into the directory you're working in, which whatever you're calling that directory, I don't know. You, see, you can see it at the top, right? It's whatever it says at the top of MATLAB. Put it in that directory, then load it, okay? And if you load it, you will find, of course, my good luck, I already have it. I'm not interested in trying to, oh, oh yeah, sorry.